This lecture was originally written for a DSM panel held by the nonprofit organization Community Access in New York City. The date of this panel was May 29th, 2013. Hello, my name is Cameron Moore, and I am deeply honored to have been asked to speak here today about a zine which I am the editor of called Depictions of Self-Identified Madness, a visionary alternative to the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders. I'm an undergraduate student studying to be a therapist. I am a radical mental health activist and organizer. I am a psychiatric survivor. I want to make clear right off the bat that I am not a Scientologist. I entered the mental health system at 13 years old, but over the next six years, I would be officially labeled with no fewer than 15 distinct psychiatric diagnoses, plus the lovely term used for the purpose of placing me in special education, quote, severely emotionally disturbed, end quote. At my current age, I am the only diagnoses I identify with are self-proclaimed, deeply empathetic trauma survivor living in the context of oppression. My entrance to Radical Mental Health was through finding the Icarus Project website five years ago. The Icarus Project is a radical mental health support and activist network that takes the form of an online community, as well as local groups around the country and the world. Many members of the Icarus Project prefer the reclaimed term madness over identifying with the construct of mental illness. The Icarus Project views madness as being a dangerous gift. For many mad people, with great suffering comes immense creativity or empathy. Being mad is dangerous in this day and age, not only for the obvious reasons, such as the fact that mad people may choose to end their lives, but due to the fact that mad people face regular discrimination, stigma, neglect, abuse, and torture, not only by the general population, but largely by the physicians, psychologists, social workers, and other professionals whose duty it is to care for them. Not only did my abuse violate human rights as defined by the United Nations, at the well-regarded hospital it violated 16 state laws or regulations. I contacted the human rights officer at that hospital who wrongly told me that it was legal. My experiences were not isolated. My experiences were not uncommon. And in comparison to some of my good friends, my experiences were extremely mild. I'd like to call your attention to two quotes from the 2013 report of the Special Rapporteur on torture and other cruel, inhuman, or degrading treatment or punishment. Quote, absolute ban on restraints and seclusion. The mandate has previously declared that there can be no therapeutic justification for the use of solitary confinement and prolonged restraint of persons with disabilities in psychiatric institutions. Both prolonged seclusion and restraint may constitute torture and ill treatment. The Special Rapporteur has addressed the issue of solitary confinement and stated that its imposition of any duration on persons with mental disabilities is cruel, inhuman, or degrading treatment. Moreover, any restraint on people with mental disabilities for even a short period of time may constitute torture and ill treatment." End quote. And this quote from the report, Forced interventions, often wrongfully justified by theories of incapacity and therapeutic necessity, inconsistent with the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, are legitimized under national laws and may enjoy wide public support as being in the alleged best interests of the person concerned. Nevertheless, to the extent that they inflict severe pain and suffering, they violate the absolute prohibition of torture and cruel, inhuman, and degrading treatment. End quote. Being told that you are being tortured or abused because you are broken, sick, or as I was told by one male nurse that I was a, quote, bad girl who needed to be punished, end quote, and that that abuse is for your own good is a special type of hell I wish upon no person. I'd like to read a quote by novelist C.S. Lewis, which appears in the beginning of my zine. I'd like to read a quote by novelist C.S. Lewis, which appears in the beginning of my zine. Quote, of all tyrannies, a tyranny exercised for the good of its victims may be the most oppressive. It may be better to live under robber barons than under omnipotent moral busybodies. The robber baron's cruel, cruelty may sometimes sleep, his cupidity may at some point be satiated. But those who torment us for our own good will torment us without end, for they do so with the approval of their own conscience. They may be more likely to go to heaven, yet at the same time likelier to make a hell of earth. 
their very kindness stings with intolerable insult. To be, quote, cured against one's will and cured of states which we may not regard as disease is to be put on a level of those who have not yet reached the age of reason or those who never will. To be classified with infants, imbeciles, and domestic animals, end quote. And there you have one of the largest problems I see with Western psychiatry as it stands today. When I sit in my college psychology classes, I sometimes think about the fact that the doctors and other psychiatric hospital staff who abused me sat in classes just like this. It's hard for me to imagine undergraduates sitting in these classes thinking, boy, I just can't wait to get into the field and torture the people I'm supposed to be helping. But all the time I hear students making comments where people with madness or mental health issues are seen as an other are reduced to their diagnosis by lack of person-centered language, such being referred to as schizophrenics instead of people with schizophrenia, and are framed as these poor people who don't know what's best for them. That mentality is the foundation for the abuse that occurs in our mental health system. It's really astonishing to me that in a field where diagnosis is based on observable and self-reported symptoms rather than a testable biological cause, that a doctor or nurse who meets with a patient for less than five minutes insists they know what is wrong with the patient and what will help them better than the patient does. I've had that experience countless times. I recall, for example, meeting with a highly regarded psychologist for a consultation. He met with me for about seven minutes while a number of other clinicians observed. At one point he said, do you know who you are? And I began to answer, saying, yes, I am a person who is, and he cut me off to let me know that his opinion was that I didn't really know who I was, that I had a, quote, unstable sense of self. As someone who spent more time in intensive psychiatric treatment in high school than living with my family, I saw many people who were in treatment receive their first diagnosis. In my experience, people usually reacted one of two ways. If the person was gravely suffering, had ongoing suffering, were confused about their experiences, or had a high respect for Western medicine, the message that they ill were often, was often easily accepted. If they were not someone who suffers very much, especially if they were there against their will, or if they came to treatment mistrustful of doctors, they might completely reject the notion that they are mentally ill, asserting that any symptoms they were experiencing were based on understandably stressful circumstances or were within the realm of typical human experiences. I have watched people who came in on day one saying, I'm not mentally ill, break down under being told constantly that you are ill, you are ill, you have a brain disease, medication is the answer, the first step is accepting you are sick. When faced with these constant messages, while being surrounded by other patients who willingly called themselves sick, some of these individuals gave up and started calling themselves mentally ill too. Many people I met in treatment were abused as children by caretakers, or were abused by people in positions of, pow of power or authority over them. These people may have been especially susceptible to internalizing what clinicians told them. The message that you are ill can be a pill that is all too easy to swallow, and being ill did almost without exception mean swallowing pills in intensive treatment, because clearly the few minutes of evaluation provided sufficient time to determine which medication must, might be most suitable for a patient. The context of the symptoms is not considered prior to starting medication. I have seen patients with symptoms that had specific meaning in the context of their culture be told their cultural or religious beliefs were actually a part of their illness. For example, a Wiccan being told her religious beliefs were delusions. Heck, I have seen patients who speak zero English be prescribed medications by, by psychiatrists who speak only English without a translator available. I can only assume the psychiatrist was practicing veterinary medicine and prescribing based on observation. Call me crazy, but it seems pretty dangerous to do that with heavy-duty psych meds when you have no idea what side effects your patient is reporting and you have no idea what their observable symptoms mean to them. I once was in a hospital with a girl who only spoke Spanish, and one evening, nurses who actually cared were using Google Translate to try to figure out what she was saying. Most of the staff, however, didn't bother. I was lucky that in abnormal psychology, I had a professor who was not only teaching the DSM, but who also liked to frequently remind the class that human suffering cannot be explained in a checklist of six DSM criteria. She told the story of working with a client and trying to avoid labeling him, and instead submitting about how his suffering was like being alone in an empty field and trying to find the resources he needed to survive, which was a metaphor that repeatedly arose in their sessions. I have experienced how diagnosis can be deeply harmful. 
I have had professionals refuse to treat me because of the stigma associated with certain diagnoses I had received. Growing up where I did, there was only two partial hospitalization programs that were close enough for me to attend as an adolescent. The one nearest me refused to keep treating me after one of my diagnoses was made. Reporting to clinicians in one intensive treatment setting that I had a specific diagnosis, they told me not to say that, that I was too nice to have that disorder. In the United States, psychiatry is a business. To get insurance to pay, you need to be able to put down a diagnosis. But diagnoses made in haste for insurance purposes can do long-term harm. Certain diagnoses meant that in intensive treatment, doctors were more likely to ignore me telling them what I knew would help me. I have experienced how getting certain labels impacted how I viewed myself and my chances at happiness. I knew from reading online that supposedly patients with certain diagnoses I had were unlikely to fully recover. I knew that with certain diagnoses I had, the suicide rate was very high. In believing there was no hope for me, I manifested hopeless situations. A month and a half before my 17th birthday, I started a tradition where I send an email a little over a year into the future to two birthdays away using a website called futureme.org. On my 18th birthday, I opened an email from 16-year-old me that began, Dear Future Me, if you're reading this now, congratulations, you didn't kill yourself, you're alive. One of the last emails I opened on my 19th birthday from 17-year-old me was, No matter what the state of things is, if you're alive and reading this despite all the struggle, then you are a survivor. I experienced how certain diagnoses meant I was being put on certain medications, multiple medications, even though many of these medications were having severe side effects. I was prescribed medications for off-label uses. I was prescribed medication as a 13 and 14 year old that were only approved for adults over the age of 18. I was told I would need to be on medication for the rest of my life. It wasn't until years of being on certain medications that I happened to learn about risks that could be lifelong like developing diabetes, which I was already at high risk for. Google told me the risks that none of my long series of doctors could be bothered to tell me. The risks that hospitals chose not to disclose during the rare times they handed out information sheets they made about medications. My doctors failing to discuss with me all the risks, benefits, and alternatives that could come with a medication meant that I was unable to provide informed consent. But when I've talked to but when I've been medicated against my will, I suppose that for many psychiatric patients, any consent is a luxury. One of the best things, in my opinion, about drug manufacturing being a business in the United States is the fact that long-term injectable forms of medication have not caught on here, no doubt because it's not profitable. I have multiple friends in countries with universal health care, such as Canada or England, who have been mandated to be on medication and their medication is administered in one, once monthly shots. At least in the United States, you can lie about taking medication that they aren't testing blood levels for. In my experience, though, lack of informed consent happens all too often in Western medicine in general. A doctor suggests medication and no questions are asked. Yet, when almost any psychiatrist will write prescriptions for psych meds, but it can be literally impossible to find a psychiatrist who is willing to help a patient get off their psych meds, a prescriber suggesting starting a certain medication cannot be taken lightly. In recent years, there have been more lawsuits against drug companies who manufacture psychiatric medication. There is also the website SSRI Stories that is a database of over 4,800 acts of violence or crimes that have been committed by people on psychiatric medication, in particular noting when they are getting on or coming off of it. This is the beginning of the school shooting section. The red arrow you see in the top right points to the tiny gray scroll bar to give you an idea of how long you can scroll for. Most of my peers were also impacted by their diagnoses. We started to see our futures as bleak. People who initially swore they were not mentally ill now told their family members how they had a serious condition that they would have for the rest of their lives. You hear stories of adults who as children with certain intellectual learning or physical disabilities were told you'll never be able to do certain things in your life and how that message damaged them. I think when the public hears about the child who is blind or the child with Down syndrome who is told they wouldn't be able to lead fulfilled lives as adults, many people get angry. 
But where is that anger when a kid gets a diagnosis of schizophrenia and their family is told they will never recover? Where is the anger when the young teenager is diagnosed with bipolar disorder and they are told they will need to stay on medication for the rest of their life? In theory, the DSM is useful for several reasons. It provides a standardized language that allows clinicians to communicate quickly about a patient's symptoms. Supposedly, accurate diagnosis predicts what treatment will be useful, and of course, diagnosis can be needed for things such as billing insurance companies. My idea for the zine was sparked when I happened upon a series of self-portraits called Drugs by Brian Lewis Saunders. In his portrait series, Mr. Saunders ingested a different single or combination of prescribed, over-the-counter, and illegal drugs. Many of the self-portraits included psychiatric medication. As a person interested in art therapy, I saw self-portraits as a particularly powerful way to convey one's experiences. I wondered what self-portraits would look like if they were of people not just describing DNI and psychiatric medication, but being mad or being a psychiatric survivor in general. The idea for my zine was born, and I began posting my call for submissions on various websites. The project generated a lot of excitement, particularly on the Icarus Project forums. The concept of reflecting on one's own experiences and planning for future struggles is deeply ingrained in the Icarus community, who call the written or artistic work that results Mad Maps. Planning for difficult times is not unique to the Icarus community. I often have been forced to agree to crisis plans before leaving hospitals, in which I agreed I would take certain steps, such as calling my therapist or going to the emergency room if I was a danger to myself or others. Never in these hospital-created plans did I see sections focused on prevention, and many of them demonize the healing powers of community, which is an element I have found so crucial to wellness. In fact, one program went as far as saying that telling anyone but a doctor or therapist you have urges to hurt yourself is emotional abuse. Some of you may be familiar with RAP, or Wellness Recovery Action Plans, developed by Mary Ellen Copeland. I highly recommend RAP as a starting point for people who are interested in mad mapping or crisis planning. The RAP is very comprehensive, including sections for planning pre- and post-crisis, and having sections about how supporters can help. Unfortunately, purchasing the RAP workbook in its entirety costs more than $15, which is a huge barrier for many people who may, other ben who may otherwise benefit greatly from RAP. There are some great free zines that are workbooks for crisis planning. My favorite is Mapping Out Madness. There are some great prompts in this scene, such as the one you see here on the right. These are some nouns I'd like to avoid, with suggestions such as substance abuse or foods that make you feel gross. And so finally, my zine was created. It was just completed in the last several days. Here you see uh, the cover of the zine. I asked everyone who submitted to do a self-portrait of their madness to tell me about both the positive and negative hallmarks of their madness, about what tools they use for wellness, and what they think their prognosis is. These are two of the self-portraits in the zine. This one, submitted by Hogma, is heightened sen tactile sensitivity. Some of the hallmarks they listed are preoccupation with how things look, feel, sound, and smell, spending a lot of time communicating with things they don't understand. And this self-portrait, trauma-induced enlightenment, with hallmarks such as body memories from trauma, drastic mood swings, and ability to form deep connections with others. Finally, I'd like to talk to you about mad pride and the concept of recovery. When you are diagnosed with the DSM, at least in the way the DSM-4 was set up, you either have a diagnosis or you don't. You either have the required five out of eight symptoms or you don't, although certainly many clinicians will make a diagnosis that they feel is most accurate, even if the specific diagnosing criteria aren't met. When the people when people who follow the biomedical model talk about, quote, getting better, what is sometimes meant by that is that the person is, quote, in remission from their mental illness, meaning they are regarded as having the possibility to relapse, but currently are living in a somewhat socially acceptable life and don't have enough of the symptoms on the checklist to be technically diagnosed. This is a protest of DSM-5 in Boston a year ago during an APA conference. These are the photos on the back of the cover of my zine. Meanwhile, in Philadelphia, the much larger protests included such activities as ripping your diagnoses. There's a great YouTube video of this. Recovery is a much better framework, but still not one I'm comfortable with. Some of you may be familiar with the organization Mind Freedom International. They are a radical psych survivor organization fighting for psychiatric patient rights. 
They started a campaign last year called I Got Better, where they asked people to submit short stories about recovering from mental health issues. The idea seems extremely similar to the It Gets Better project on YouTube, where queer and trans adults talk about how things were bad for them when they were younger because of them being queer or trans, but their life got better, which is supposed to encourage LGBT plus youth who are being bullied to not take their own lives. The reason, quote, getting better bothers me is because I don't think I was ever sick. It goes back to the C.S. Lewis quote, quote, to be cured of states we may not regard as disease, end quote. Did I severely suffer? Yes, I did, and at times I still do. Did I have emotion-based experiences outside the realm of typical human experiences? Yes, I did, and yes, I do. But that doesn't make me ill. Suffering is human. In nature, diversity allows ecosystems to thrive. It's crucial to stay radical as we as people working in human services or in caretaking roles interact with mad folk and psychiatric survivors. In my abnormal psych class, we were taught what determines mental illness is the four Ds, deviance, danger, dysfunction, and distress. If someone is different from you and you don't understand but they are content as they are, leave them alone. In one residential program I was in, one of my dear friends, this 13-year-old girl, would want to be going out into town or to school in pink pajama pants, combat boots, and fairy wings. She went through this phase where she wanted to wear the fairy wings all the time. After a while, they started saying, no, you have to dress like a normal person. But you know what? It's different. It's deviance from social norms, but she's happy, so why are you interfering? Who is the intervention for, you or her? Then you have danger and dysfunction. In working with my therapist who specializes in trauma, she will often talk about how for trauma survivors to be able to recover, they have to have safety first. If you need safety for recovery, it will be impossible for many people to recover. For a lot of people, there isn't a promise of ongoing safety. There's a threat of being locked up on a psych ward suddenly because someone takes what you say out of context or thinks you are going to hurt yourself. Many people in this country are living in the context of multiple oppressions. I'm talking about gender-based violence and discrimination, race-based violence and discrimination, violence and discrimination based on sexual orientation, uh, immigrant, stand, immigrant status, gender identity, class standing. I strongly identify as a feminist and feel the impact of rape culture. Am I being abused by an intimate partner? No, but patriarchy doesn't seem to be going away in the near future. There is this idea of a hierarchy of needs, that eating and staying hydrated and sleeping and having a place inside to live are the most important things. But for some people, being able to express themselves freely is more important than having a place to live indoors. For some people, being able to decide how they use the day, being able to be, ha, be, being able to spend time in nature or with friends is more important than having the steady income of a job. When I interact with clients at my internship, I try to come to conversations with the mindset of how I can be most helpful to them in whatever way they deem to be helpful. I work in a community center and a lot of the clients are homeless. Some nights when it is 25 degrees in the winter, I'd be talking to them and feeling like, we really need to figure out if there's a shelter that has a bed for you, but many of them would prefer to sleep outside or in the train station than be in a shelter. And many of them, to many of them, the most valuable way we could spend time together was talking about things happening in the news or drinking tea together. In 3.5 years of near constant intensive treatment, my primary identity was Cameron, mentally ill person. Today I am suffering less and accomplishing more than I ever thought possible. There are days I think back on all the times I was close to death, and I'm amazed I am even alive today. At two months before my 16th birthday, I didn't expect to live to turn 16. I went through a period of time when a therapist I was seeing would say, see you next week at the end of sessions, and I would not feel confident at all I would live that long. I never expected to live to my 18th birthday. I didn't expect to live to graduate high school. Going to college saved my life. Being able to identify as a student instead of just a chronic mental patient was crucial. So many times of my year, in my years of intensive treatment, it would occur to me that pushing away from darkness wasn't enough, that you had to have something to be moving towards. School was something to move towards for me. I loved being in class, and this year became president of a social club on campus. I was getting, I was one of the organizers of a local Icarus group and have been involved in some other activist work. I got a dog who was very helpful for me. Acupuncture has been helpful.
But besides being in college, two of the biggest things that have enabled me to have made it this far are getting off of medication and my wonderful therapist. Working with my therapist means interacting with someone who is in the Western model, but she is a feminist and has strived to be open to my radical views of mental health. She recognized immediately that being hospital was out being hospitalized was out of the question for me and made herself very available to me in times of struggle in between sessions. She says I have influenced her thinking about medication. I was first put on medication when I was first depressed at 13. By the time I graduated high school, I would have been tried on over 30 different medications for psychiatric reasons on combinations of up to seven at a time. Since I started medication, I had never been off of all medication for more than five days at a time. I had read many stories of people in the Icarus Worms who thrived off of medications and felt that largely the medication was causing their madness. For example, Western psychiatry says to treat schizophrenia, the person must be on medication, yet here were many people who had received that diagnosis and recovered off of medication. I read studies that showed that patients who were started on antipsychotics versus patients who weren't recovered faster during a period of acute psychosis, but patients who were kept on antipsychotics long term were much more chronically ill over patients who were not kept on a maintenance dose of antipsychotics. When a model of treatment for psychosis called Soteria Houses existed in the United States, where the patients were there voluntarily, primarily treated with therapy, and restraints were not used, studies found they fared as well as or better than their peers in hospitals. Today I am hoping a system of treating psychosis in Finland called Open Dialogue will catch on in the United States. Open Dialogue utilizes community-based treatment that involves the patient's family and the therapy with very minimal, if any, medication. In a five-year study, 83% of patients had returned to their jobs or, or had returned to their jobs or were looking for a job. In the same study, 77% did not have any residual symptoms. Excitingly, there is now a U.S. training center for dialogic practice, and a program in Vermont has recently received funding to run a trial of open dialogue model in their state. There are studies that show being on antipsychotics make you have super sensitivity to psychosis. The first time I hallucinated was withdrawing from a psychiatric medication to go on a new one. The first time I was psychotic, or as I like to say, having an altered state, was after already being on antipsychotics for a year and a half. I can't help but wonder if I was never started on these medications, if I wouldn't have started having altered states. When I decided last year I wanted to get off all of my medication, I met huge resistance from my prior psychiatrist and current therapist who told me if I attempted to get off my antipsychotic, I would be floridly psychotic and would have to drop out of college. A year later, I'm still in the process of getting off my medication, but so far I've been extremely successful and have proved them very wrong. Getting off of some of my medication so far has made me much less suicidal, have less mood swings, be happier, be more spontaneous, get some of my creativity back, be able to make friends more easily, have romantic interests again, and lose weight. I think being less deadened by the medication allowed me to also start questioning my gender and realize that I'm transgender. I came out as trans in November, and it, though it took a while for people to adjust to my preferred name and pronouns, some, and some are still struggling to learn my preferred pronouns, being able to explore my gender identity has made me happier too. This image is a cartoon that is included in the zine by, that is created by an Icarus user. The psychiatrist pours in the acne grade DSM junk and the patient vomits it out. Thanks to the American Psychiatric Association, we now have a new DSM. But in my opinion, it's thanks to the work of people who don't buy into the DSM that the current psych patients and mad people can have hope. Thank you.